the next talk is from uh, Damien Turci and David Evenstein, who are the, the founder of the Drexel chapter and the current president of the chapter. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from them. This is the first time that, that we've met, although we've been working together for a couple of years. They first, uh, the, Drexel, the Drexel folks first approached us at, at Icarus uh, shortly after the, the 2013 Starship Congress. And uh, you know, we, were, we were actively seeking a way to, to try to get interstellar education and inspiration, you know, into into school. So they felt they fell and they and they filled that gap really, really quite nicely. They've been participating very actively in Icarus's projects over the last couple of years. Um, they participate in, in Project Icarus and with Project Tintin. They've attended some conferences with us. So, without further further ado, uh, Damien and uh, and David, if you would like to come up. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Damien Turchi. I am the founder of Drexel's chapter of Icarus Interstellar. And the, the main reason behind the speech that the two of us are going to give today will be to discuss Project Zeus, which is Drexel's answer to Project Icarus. However, before I hand the stage over to David Evenstein, I always have trouble pronouncing his last name, before I hand that over, I would like to take this opportunity to tell you my insights on the invaluable need for student involvement in the development of making a starship. Dr. Tsiolis, he wrote in 2012 a paper concerning Starflight Academy. And in this, he says that interstellar engineering education is the great motivation for change that will be needed so that we can reach for the stars, and in doing so, make the solar system our playground. But how can we do this reaching when there are so few of us? We need numbers, and I think one of the ways to do this is to create student chapters all over the world. Let students know that this is not science fiction that this can be scientific reality if we work together on this, which is perhaps the greatest endeavor that the human race has ever set out to complete. So when you go home, in the audience, and anyone watching at home, create a student chapter at the university that you are affiliated with. This will create knowledge. This will create passion. And most importantly, this will create numbers. How can we develop an interstellar spacecraft without bringing a whole generation of new people to become involved in our cause? Think about this. These students that you make chapters for will become the next round of professors managers, and politicians. And then they will perhaps remember that club in school that had such a consuming desire for the survival of the human race that they will enact it into their classroom lectures, into their company policies, and into their legislation. So I am challenging you today to go and create a student chapter. Let's take Drexel as an example. We started three years ago, and in that time, we've done some pretty incredible things for not even having aerospace engineering offered at this school. The students involved in this chapter, they created a spacecraft, theoretically, a 70-page design report on a plasma jet magneto-inertial fusion propulsion. Just, wow, like, how did they do that? They're students that don't even know about aerospace engineering. Many, very few of them know about nuclear engineering. Also, we have a student who 
he just completed his freshman year. And for his summer, he worked on field emission electric propulsion. His name is Noah Alessi, and you will see his poster today about experimentally characterizing this. On less serious note of what the students have been involved with, there was one meeting where we wanted to explain general relativity without having to introduce ten tensor mathematics. So we got Plato. And what we did with this Plato was, for those who are unfamiliar, we were able to create space-time metrics. You know, fold the Play-Doh over, put a hole through it. Look, there's a black a wormhole going through space-time. And then the students broke out into groups and created their own exotic space-time metrics. Maybe there is an alternate solution other than the Alcubierre warp drive that will feasibly allow faster-than-light travel. So, I want to show you this for the first time. Um, this, uh, if my pointer will work, there we go. So this is an animation of the plasma jet magneto inertial fusion system for the Zeus spacecraft. It looks pretty cool, right? This is this is. Um, I, I just saw this the other day. It, it blew my mind. And the idea that we are going to do to expand with this is that we want to connect this animation to numerical solutions of the governing equations for this fusion system that are calculated via simulant, simulant. And then what we could do is change colors on this animation so that the technical audience watching could actually see changing magnitudes of physical parameters. So not only would this animation have a reason for the non-technical crowd to see it, because it looks cool and it explains the fundamental concept behind it, but also the technical crowd could see changing parameters and have some type of rationale behind this. And when we were creating this, we got the, the idea that we don't just need to do this for Icarus Interstellar. We could expand this beyond to any type of new engineering system and perhaps sell it in a contract. And then I had the idea that maybe we could give a percentage of this contract to Icarus Interstellar for bir birthing such a different type of look on things. Here's another type of um, animation of the plasma jet magneto inertial fusion system. Pretty cool looking stuff. So anyway, I digress. Um, within three years, we went from five founding members to over 60. If we assume a constant growth rate, within five years, we will have approximately 100 members. Now imagine if 10 of you go out and create student chapters. Within five years, we will have 1,000 new members of Icarus Interstellar. We will have numbers. But for those watching at home and those in the audience, I want to take it a step further. Not 10, no. We need to do 50. 50, so that by 2020, we can have 5,000 student members. Imagine a Starship Congress with 5,000 student members. That would be absolutely crazy. And we could have competitions with these members to actually push forward this research that only a select few are working on right now across the world. And even though there are few of us right now, we are spread out throughout the world. Our leader is in Alaska. We have the leader of Project Icarus in London. Well, you know, the UK. Um, we also have members in Australia, if I'm not mistaken. Florida, there's, there's a few in South America as well. We could have student chapters showing up literally across the world. Just do it. So with that, let's become the AIAA of interstellar engineers. Thank you. So thank you, Damien, for that stellar introduction and this interstellar chapter.
My name is David Evenstein, and I'm the current president of uh, Drexel Interstellar, and I have been since the spring. But I've actually been a member of this ambitious group since nearly day one. Now, I'd like to say straight away, the best part of working on this Project Icarus was all of the very unique, very exciting knowledge that we gained from it. Finally, we students who were not aerospace majors, we are spread across a bunch of different disciplines. Finally, we students could tell our friends, listen, this is rocket science. This is what we're working on. And the quantity and quality of all we learned while designing our student spaceship was uh, mind-blowing. And it's an, uh, very valuable to us and something that we'll hold on to for a long time. So without further ado, I'd like to unravel for all of you our Project Zeus and maybe share some of that learning with you. So I'll begin with PJMIF. Damien mentioned it a few times. Plasma Jet Magneto Inertial Fusion. It sounds like a bunch of uh, very techno babbly words strung together. But uh, that's the mouthful that was thrown at us rocket rookies as we started this project. That's the field of physics few of us had ever ventured into. And that's the method with which we had to carry a 1,000 ton craft to Alpha Centauri, four light years away in less than 100 years. Um, that was an intense challenge. So I'm going to go through it now and hopefully give everyone a close look at its inner workings. And I'll begin with plasma. Plasma jet magneto inertial fusion. So plasma. Why plasma? Plasma has been studied since the early 50s as a subject for nuclear fusion. And a nuclear fusion engine is one of the requirements of Project Icarus. Now, what are we going to do with said plasma? We're not blowing it up using chemical reactions as a typical rocket would. We're not peeling off electrons for ion propulsion. No, we have to give this so much energy that it goes through nuclear fusion. We have to be bigger, we have to be better, we have to be more powerful than any engine ever developed before. All those are already developed technologies, too slow for us. We need to think big. So, plasma. For parameters I'll mention later, we chose the plasma deuterium, which is a hydrogen isotope with a proton and neutron. Now, what do we need to do with this deuterium? We first step, we need to get it in the engine. Our engine, has uh, two theta pinches located on opposite sides of this nozzle that you see here. Now what do these theta pinches do? They take the plasma, they confine it using a very clever magnetic field uh, in a configuration known as a spheromag. And it shoots out two of these plasmas from opposite sides. They uh, form, mingle at the middle, and finally merge into a plasma. And they sit there peacefully right up until they're promptly shot. This brings me to the jet portion of plasma jet magneto inertial fusion. <clears throat> Project Daedalus, our precursor, which has been mentioned already, employed lasers in order to energize this plasma target and bring it to nuclear fusion. But the PJMIF concept decides instead, why use lasers when you can throw even more high energy plasma into the mix, adding to your reaction mass for the fusion and donating that energy to the target. So jets, <clears throat> um, essentially a rail gun that fires a very high energy magnetically accelerated plasma. Now studies have been done on this before which used everything from four to 48 of such jets, but <clears throat> 48 jets, that might be enough for an evening stroll to the moon, but not to Alpha Centauri. So we had to think bigger, we had to scale it up. 150 <coughs> plasma jet rail guns. That drew much more satisfactory numbers, and that would have been capable of carrying us to Alpha Centauri. So what's next? Plasma jet magneto inertial. Magneto inertial is what we need to cover. Now, the magneto inertial part is very interesting. That is what actually incites the fusion and gives the energy to the plasma target we discussed. These 150 jets, when converging on our plasma target, donate not only their inertial energy as they're traveling at Mach speeds and impacting this from all sides, creating a spherical pressurizer known as a liner, but they also give it a bunch of magnetic force. Now that magnetic force, what it does is it takes the spheromac that we have and converts it to a field reverse configuration. But I'll keep it simple for the sake of this speech. 
Basically, it propagates magnetic shock waves all throughout the target, thus giving it additional energy. Now, the energy that this system provides is just enough to activate deuterium into fusion. Not just enough, it's actually ample energy, uh, megajoules of energy donated by these jets to the plasma target via magneto-inertial confinement. So that's when the kaboom happens. That's when fusion occurs. <clears throat> So fusion, there you go, the last word, the final piece of the puzzle in plasma jet magneto inertial fusion. Now this reaction, this reaction happens inside of our nozzle as you saw in the simulation a few slides ago. And you have a nuclear fusion reaction occurring inside of your spacecraft. So how do you get that out? How do you get it to not directly impact your spaceship? Well, that's my favorite part of the design. You notice these copper colored uh, coils, well they are copper, or would be, uh, <clears throat> describing the profile of the nozzle. Now those generate a donut-shaped magnetic field all throughout it. And when the 1.5 septillion individual fusion reactions occur inside of our engine, particles of energies averaging 3.5 mega electron volts are shot in all directions. And once these come close to those coils, come close inside of that magnetic field, the magnetic field is actually deflected into a parabolic shape, a shape that is essentially the same as our nozzle, um, pretty much parallel to it. And because of this contour, all of these charged particles are deflected straight outwards along our desired axis of motion. And from that, from that we get thrust. Now thrust values from this craft range from 0.5 to 15 meganewtons. It, it's not the biggest, uh, most powerful uh, engine that exists, um, but our ISP value has shown numbers that were incredibly high, ranging in the area of uh, 1.5 million seconds. That means that we can make it to Alpha Centauri with only 4.5 to 6 years burn time. That means we only have to pack as much fuel as we need to burn for 6 years straight. Now, of course, that's a lot of time, but uh, Three years uh, fire accelerating there and three years back isn't actually that bad, and our engine can more than handle it. And uh, the ISP uh, actually gives us uh, fuel mass of only 78% of the ship has to be fuel, which for interstellar probes of this size, not that bad, not too shabby. <clears throat> so now that we have PJMIF, plasma jet magneto inertial fusion, it's no longer techno valuable, right? And you have your foundation for an interstellar probe. You have your ticket to Alpha Centauri four or eight years away. Now that we have that, I'd like to look at other inventive aspects of our design uh, brought to us by our members. Now, those of you who are unusually keen uh, might have noticed that our magnetic gizmos, they don't deal with the neutrons coming out of the uh, reaction. Those have energies of around 14.1 mega electron volts. And they're shooting everywhere, and there's nothing to deflect them. There's only the actual physical ship to stop them. And if we tried absorbing that much energy from a fusion reaction, we'd be flying an interstellar puddle in a matter of minutes. So we have two systems in place to combat this, designed by uh, members of our organization. The first, a tritium breeding section. Now, tritium breeding, what is that? Uh, when these neutrons collide with isotopes of lithium contained in a tank uh, going throughout the plumbing of the nozzle and above it to protect the rest of the craft, when those uh, <clears throat> neutrons collide with lithium-6 isotopes, they produce, among a few other byproducts, a tritium plasma as well as a neutron. Now, what is this tritium? Tritium is another, similar to deuterium except with one extra neutron, plasma of hydrogen. But throwing that into our fuel, throwing that into our engine, would reduce the energy requirements of our fusion. That's very beneficial to us, we like that. So we're gonna put lithium-6 uh, shielding around it. Now lithium-6, the reaction also produces a neutron of lower energy. That neutron, coincidentally, when reacting with lithium-7, produces even more tritium, uh, plus plus for us. Um, so we have this tritium which is actively being produced by our fusion reactions which we can recycle into the fuel. And now since tritium is unstable, unlike deuterium, it only has a 13 year half-life, uh, due to the active production, we don't have to worry about that. 
So it's just an added bonus and it lowers the energy of incoming neutrons. Now the rest of the neutrons are completely stopped by a bismuth loaded polyethylene shield. Now calculations have shown that this shield does not need to be especially thick or massive to protect the rest of the craft after the neutrons have been filtered through lithium. So uh, our fuel tanks, our data modules, our payload, all of that is safe now due to the uh, neutron shielding that we provide. The rest of the heat accumulated by that can be filtered out and radiated by conventional means. Now, when we unveiled our design for the first time at the Atlanta conference, uh, I distinctly remember the pr attendees there looked at the conical bell and immediately wrinkled their noses and had this general expression of disgust. Aerodynamics <laughs> in space. Uh, um, but, of course, that's not the purpose of our design. Uh, the conical bell. Well, it was actually because we have members ranging from uh, such a wide field of disciplines that we happen to have an armored vehicle enthusiast among us. And he suggested an angled uh, shield for the craft. Now why do we need a shield in front of the craft in the first place? For those of you who have already done the math, four light years away, 100 years, that means you have to travel at 4% the speed of light, which is fast. Um, anything that's in our way, uh, Anything that's even a milligram in mass, a dust particle, uh, for example, would shatter our ship. It would rip straight through it if we did not have the proper protection. It would render it useless. So we need to have something to uh, at least somehow uh, prevent this sort of uh, catastrophic effect. So angled shielding. A bumper at the front of the ship, uh, which was our original concept, uh, would have to be fairly thick and very massive in order to save us from this. But if we get a conical shield, which has the same uh, mass and thickness for a similar radius as just a plain flat bumper, um, can actually deflect a great degree of a particle's energy as it collides with our craft. Now, our materials uh, members and uh, those who did research on it developed uh, Kevlar and aluminum foam uh, material for this. Uh, aluminum foam because after an initial impact, which would be deflected, our ship would survive. Actually, with this design, it survives uh, impacts of up to one gram of mass at 4% the speed of light, which is, wow, you're not gonna find uh, bigger than that in interstellar space. We hope, at least, we don't know for sure. Um, if we do, eh, nothing we can do about that. Um, if we hit UFOs on the way, we'll, we'll have to leave a note that says we apologize. Um, so this, uh, this aluminum foam at the top actually has small regenerative properties where it so it fills itself in after cratering, which is good because we need that smooth outer layer in order to, for that deflection of energy to occur. So moving on, uh, we also have I'd like to talk about our mission when we reach Alpha Centauri. So we have this huge conical shield. We slow down at Alpha Centauri, and what do we do with it? We don't need it anymore. It's not shielding us from anything. So we proposed to open it up. Similar to a flower blooming, it would fold on hinges uh, into petals. Now, that opened our eyes to a lot of possibilities. You could put a lot of things in a shield of that design. For example, you could have solar panels lining the, in lining the inside of it, and then point it at the sons of uh, the Alpha Centauri system and charge up from that, Alpha Centauri specifically, um, in this case. <clears throat> and um, alternatively, you could spread a spider web, whether printed or pre-packed, a mesh that goes between the petals, and once you fold it up, you effectively, effectively have a communications receiver. Point that at Earth, and you can receive messages and you can send uh, from our communication system. Now, additionally, you see here these uh, buoys on tethers. Those are what we refer to as sensor buoys. As soon as that shield is removed, as soon as we get to Alpha Centauri, our ship begins a roll. This roll unfurls these uh, buoys, which take measurements of the system. They have a wide array of scientific equipment for taking um, planetary analysis, uh, calculating distances between local objects, and cameras for transmitting HD feeds to back to our home planet. 
so that people here in 100 years can view what's going on at Alpha Centauri for themselves. Um, of course, by that time, hopefully they'll already be planning their trip to go there, but uh, we could send postcards. <coughs> so, you have PJMIF, you have our Zeus spacecraft. Um, this was all designed by simply a relatively small team of members all working together very studiously, um, all showing tremendous amounts of effort um, in developing this craft. So I'd like for you to imagine what would happen if we had these 5,000 members of interstellar chapters around the world. We could have people designing starships, interstellar probes, satellites, CubeSats, uh, warp drives even, colony ships to send between the stars. What we want is for people to look at this presentation, students in particular, and see what the possibilities are. And maybe we challenge them to do better than us. We challenge them to do a ship that could do it in 50 years, or in 25 years, or a ship that can carry humans there. We want students to zoom out. We want students <coughs> to build a starship. Thank you very much.